Hi, and welcome to another episode of Forward Thinking. Back in 2017, a group of young technologists found themselves very frustrated with the way that their technical internships were going in government. Um, and unlike people who just sit around grousing about such things, they decided to do something about it. Uh, they launched a blog, and then eventually that blog turned into um, a series of events and a community and a newsletter. And finally, it became a movement. And today, I want to talk about the topic of succession planning and bringing on new talent in the world of digital government. And I'm thrilled to be joined by three people who've been part of that movement and are now working as a result of those initiatives that started in 2017. So we're going to talk to Coding It Forward, a fantastic organization that helps technologists find their place in government. And we're going to be joined by three people who've been part of that program. Uh, first of all, Ariana Soto. Uh, Diana Negron and Rachel Stone. And it's my great pleasure to have all three of you here today to talk about this stuff. Um, so maybe first we'll start by explaining who you are and then we'll get into a little bit about coding it forward and, and where things have gone from then. Uh, Ariana, hi, nice to see you. Hi, thanks for having me slash us. Um, I'm Ariana Soto. I work for Coding It Forward, uh, and I am Coding It Forward's Director of Strategic Initiatives. I was not part of the founding crew in 2017, but I joined shortly after in 2018 and have been with them ever since. So I'm very much a part of, of the movement that we've tried to get going uh, since our founding. Awesome. And Diana, how are you? Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, I joined Coding It Forward as a fellow in 2018 in the Department of Health Human Services and now serve as a policy advisor in state government. Awesome, and Rachel? Hi, yeah, Rachel Stone, thank you for having me. And um, I'm here as the Chief Data Officer for the state of Utah out of the Utah Governor's Office of Planning and Budget. And Diana and Rachel, you're both products of Coding It Forward, is that fair to say? Yeah. Maybe not They're the best way to say it. I'm sure you're course, more than that. They were a part of our programs. <laughs> right. Um, so, Ariana, can you explain what is Coding It Forward and how is it different from other civic tech organizations that our viewers might be familiar with, like the Code For movement? Sure. So as you mentioned, we were started in 2017 by a group of college students. Um, they were looking to kind of find tech internships in government. Uh, in the summer of 2017. And all they could find was installing Microsoft Share, SharePoint as an unpaid intern on government computers, which just wasn't going to cut it for them. So as you said, we started kind of as a jobs board, as a newsletter to kind of get students aware of what opportunities were out there. Um, and then we're lucky enough to be connected to someone at the US Census Bureau who is looking to bring early career tech talent into the US Census Bureau that summer and thus became our pilot initiative, which is no longer a pilot, but the Civic Digital Fellowship, which is a 10 week internship for young technologists to work at federal government agencies. And we've been doing that ever since. Uh, we will be welcoming over a hundred students to federal government agencies this summer. Uh, we have over 200 alums to date, which include Rachel and Diana. Um, and so that is kind of our, our big thing that we've been doing for the past couple of years. Uh, we just launched our first state and local government opportunity that will be kicking off this summer, which Rachel will be a part of, but I'm sure we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, but that's kind of what we do. We're kind of, I guess, where we're positioned in this space. You have folks like the US Digital Service and 18F, Code for America, who are doing absolutely incredible work. And we're so, so thankful to be a part of that community. But the little piece that we fit, I think, is that early career pipeline. Um, there are lots of op awesome opportunities for mid-career and senior level technologists to kind of work in government. Um, and we're still a little bit um, lacking on opportunities for uh, students and recent grads and people who are trying to make their first uh, step in the job market be government. And so we provide internships for students to kind of get a sense of what's out there and in the hopes that they come back and they continue to serve after their touch point with us. So is it specifically people with a technology or coding background that you're trying to place? Yeah, for the most part. So we mostly recruit software engineers, data scientists, 
product managers and designers. So those are the kind of four skill sets. And I think we've had everything few and far in between in those four categories, like history majors who know how to code. And so it's not it's not stuck to just people who are specifically studying CS. Um, we have art history majors and all kinds of people who just happen to also have kind of technical know-how and abilities too. So Diana, when did you know you wanted to get into the public service? I think for me, it started, I did an internship with the Department of Agriculture in DC. And I think that really had started it off, um, but it was unpaid. So it, it got me interested, but um, I really didn't know how I could possibly move sort of move forward. I didn't see too much trajectory from there. Um, but then definitely when I joined Coding and Forward in 2018 um, and saw some of the work in the different departments and agencies, I sort of realized I started as I started grad school as well, um, that I was going to enter local, local or local, state or federal government at that point, um, just being exposed to that experience. All right. And Rachel, um, were you a computer scientist first or a public servant first? <laughs> um, I was attempting to be a public servant. I was um, kind of from the DC area is where I grew up during my teenage years. And so I was around a lot of the sort of government um, environment and sort of that resonated with me. And I took that and started a political science degree at BYU as an undergrad. Um, but very quickly, as I imagined myself working in government, I was like, there's no way I can solve problems unless I know how technology works. That's how the world works now. So I went and took a lot of computer science and data related classes and um, sort of created a dual degree. Is that reflective of most of your members, Ariana? Do you find most people are, they're called to a life of public service and then decide they need to get technology or are they nerdy and like, hey, I can put this stuff to good use in the service of society afterwards. I think that it's it's likely a, a mix of both and all the things in between. I think um, as we've grown and continue to offer this opportunity across a number of years, we've found that more people are starting to realize that opportunities like this exist. But I can't tell you how many people I've interviewed who have been like, oh my God, I didn't realize I could use my tech skills in government. Like, this is so cool. And so that's always super fun. And I just hope that we get to a point where, um, I think something that we always like to say is like, the world's, the country's top lawyers go to work for the government. So like, why can't the same be true for technologists? Like, we want everyone who wants to do technology to know that government is out there for them as an option. Um, so I would say it's a mix. There are people uh, who st I started out in local government and I was looking for ways to continue to do tech in government. But I think there are tons of students who just like weren't told that they could do this. And that's what we're trying to kind of. Uh, that's a, that, uh, to dig into that. Yeah. <laughs> out of the 535 members of Congress that there are, uh, if I remember correctly, the count of uh, lawyers in Congress is incredibly high. 168 representatives and 57 senators have a law degree. And I don't think many of them have a computer science degree. <laughs> Probably so, not. Uh, do you think that we're going to get that to change? Or is it that politics is about laws, not technology, and therefore won't? Like, how are we going to shift that mindset? Because when you have people passing laws that are not implementable as technology, or when they're making policy decisions that don't understand the consequences of underfunding certain technologies and what's that's going to happen down, downstream, we're kind of treating the extern the, the future as an externality. So uh, uh, is, is Coding It Forward or other civic tech groups doing anything to try and push for greater technical literacy in our elected officials? Yeah, I'll defer to Diana and Rachel in case they know of other folks, but I know there's one organization, Tech Congress, who is specifically placing technically capable and knowledgeable um, folks across a number of different areas. I think some people are more policy related and some people are more technology focused, like hard technology. So they're one fantastic org that we love who's doing that work with Congress specifically of, of placing um, people who do have that know-how there. And I think with the hopes of hopefully turning the people who actually have those seats in Congress to people who do have that knowledge firsthand. But um, yeah, I think that work is, is being done and is obviously very, very important. Rachel and Diane, I don't know if you have other thoughts there. 
I would just add, I mean, like the school that you go to or have, have or did you graduate? <laughs> I'm graduated <laughs> a yeah. year now. It feels like not though, because it just happened, but we've been sitting in this pandemic, but yes. Yeah, yeah. last year was just March, November. It was like one long month. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> True, I'm losing track of everybody, but um, I mean, Harvard's done a great job, especially, I, you know, in the past five years, I think especially, you know, with, um, taking leaders that came out of the Obama administration and transforming the good work that they did into basically a curriculum for the future leaders that are attending Harvard Kennedy and um, Harvard and, and getting a government degree. Would you agree? I mean, that, I feel like that that will have great impact, you know, if it hasn't already, definitely in years to come. Yeah, no, I think I would agree with that. And I think we've seen it when when coding it forward kind of started in 2017, there wasn't even just civic tech at large, not even just in, in the, this congressional kind of vein that we're talking about, just wasn't fully developed. Uh, I think it was just starting to pop up and people were starting to define what that meant. And then we've seen in the past uh, four to five years, as you said, Rachel, all these different organizations and movements kind of pop up, which is really exciting across a number of different schools. I know um, Georgetown's Beck Center does a lot of work in the space as well. And um, New America's Public Interest Tech University Network is bringing all kinds of universities into the fold. So, uh, yeah. If it's are not there any examples now, of this? Uh, sorry. Are, are there any examples of this being done in other countries effectively? That is a great question. Um, I don't have a, a, a good beat on other, I, who is, oh, you know what we have friends in, well, we have friends in Canada who, uh, you know, we've talked about Alistair who are doing this work, but um, I'm trying to think of who else. It does seem like in some countries, government is cool again. Uh, you know, when you see New Zealand and Jacinta Ardern and how they handled COVID, there's this sense of like, wow, I can do government tech. That's a cool job, right? And there's other places where it seems like this onerous bureaucratic drudgery. Uh, it's almost like a lot of the succession planning and modernization of government begins with a uh, an advertising campaign to reposition government work as as useful, fun, productive, and possibly even a career choice. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think we see a, a lot of the problem with the barrier to entry at all all levels of government. Um, even as something as simple as starting an application process um, and like and the way you apply for federal jobs and state jobs. And um, there's this sort of, I think, also misconception of what working in the government is like. Um, and there really needs to be a massive turnaround to thinking of rethinking about recruitment and the hiring process, uh, especially in federal government to start with. Since that process can take anywhere from six months um, or more, and, and not everyone has that luxury of time. I, I've heard people say that government work is different from private sector work because in private sector work, you're looking for a market opportunity you can get to first that you can make money off and so on. Um, and so you tend to be solving for the, the mass market and you tend to be much more interested in sort of the short-term gains. Um, and asking for forgiveness rather than for permission. Whereas in government work, you tend to be solving for the edge cases, you tend to be solving for all of the different constituents and stakeholders, and you need to talk to everybody who might be able to say no before moving ahead. Um, I may be painting an unfair portrayal of that, but that's certainly a perception I think that, that government recruitment needs to overcome uh, if you wanna convince people that the work in government can be fulfilling. Um, so Diana and Rachel, you're both doing amazing things. and, and and working on cool problems at scale, what is it that you would say to someone who looks at uh, a possible career in government and says, no, it's not for me, it's too risk averse and so on? Rachel, maybe you can start that one. Oh, um, well, you, you have to um, be ready to put your seatbelt on because it, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it is kind of a wild ride. I mean, you do, I was thinking about this, uh, you know, Gen Z. I, I'm, I was born in 1995. I'm like right on the border of being a millennial and a Gen Zer. And, and so you could consider like, you know, Diana and Ariana and me to kind of be like the first Gen Zs, like making our foray into government. Like, are we gonna last? Because government, you know, has been, like you said, um, one of these um, institutions is about institutional knowledge and red tape and, Kind of you know building a lifelong career 
And I think our generation is, you know, self-taught. We have the internet. We can learn anything. We can, um, you know, break down barriers that have been um, institutionalized in society, like a lot easier than in previous generations. And so we're used to kind of the move fast and break things. Um, and that's not totally what government um, is. Um, and, and so I think, um, I, I, I think that um, we have an opportunity to change government. I think government has an opportunity to temper us. Um, and I, I, you know, we're not here to necessarily save government, but I think um, it does take a certain level of bravery, I think, from individuals our age to um, embrace the challenges that government has and kind of see them for the long game that, that some of them are. Diana. That also requires that you you assume that you're going to be in government all your life. I mean, it's always been like you're a career bureaucrat or you work in the private sector. Are you seeing a model where people might do one and then the other or like come into public service for a few years, then go back to the private sector? Or is that problematic as well? No, I think there's definitely a new type of revolving door to be had um, and careers. Um, I, I don't think our generation thinks of long term careers. Um, I mean, I was looking at retirement trends for people who are our age. We're not even close to retirement, but uh, it seems like there's an idea that I'm going to have multiple careers throughout my career. Um, I'm going to reinvent myself and I'm going to try solving problems from lots of different angles. May that be public sector, private sector. I'm going to start a startup. I don't, you know, I could be all sorts of things. How about you, Dana? Yeah. No, I definitely also agree and see this revolving door between private and public sector. Um, usually I see a lot of people go to private sector and then public sector first. Um, the one thing in the public sector, though, is the outdated systems that we, they have. So the, those skills that you gain in the public sector um, in certain stages, in certain systems, um, are not trans, trans, you can't transform, it's not transferable um, it, when you go back into the private sector. Um, and people want to be competitive in the job market. Um, so we have to sort of revamp this process to have a modernization um, through all levels and, and really streamline some of these processes. That's super interesting that the, the skills are not necessarily transferable. So if you switch from one to the other, you find yourself not as far ahead. Um, I wanna read you a quote from when I was a kid, I used to read um, a lot of science fiction books. This is by uh, Arthur C. Clarke from Imperial Earth. And he says, for the last century, almost all top political appointments on the planet Earth have been made by random computer selection from the pool of individuals who had the necessary qualifications. It had taken the human race several thousand years to realize there were some jobs that should never be given to the people who volunteered for them, especially if they showed too much enthusiasm. As one shrewd political commentator had remarked, we want a president who has to be carried kicking and screaming into the White House, but that will then do the best job he or she possibly can so that they'll get time off for good behavior. Um, and I'm updating some of the pronouns from an admittedly somewhat outdated book. Um, that does strike me as a very different mentality, that there's this idea of being called to public service or being called to office that immediately flags you as someone who's a little too eager to have control over lives of others. How do we rebrand? Like what, what should government be in a world where the job market is more of a revolving door, where people are gonna have multiple careers, where you can definitely do service in public and in private. You know, you may have a day job, but be working hard in civic tech or blogging or researching or being an activist in your spare time in ways that simply weren't possible before technology came along. What do you three think the, the right government branding is to ensure that the best and brightest people decide to devote some of their time to making their country a better place? Oof, that's a big, a big question. <laughs> What's the branding? I mean, this is not a fully cohesive thought, but I think what I've been thinking a lot about, especially in, in the past year, is amongst the younger folks in this country, there's a um, people are using technology and, and the mediums that we have to really make their voices heard and, and speak up about things that they want to change. And obviously there are uh, government structures that make the way the country run happen. Uh, but I think a way to rebrand this work is 
like, hey, like you want to do something about these issues and come come join, come join the government, come do this work um, where it happens, where the decisions are being made, like bring your enthusiasm to this space and maybe all of us together can kind of reshape this old clunky machine that has existed for the however many years, you know? Um, I think Rachel and Diana's work is really a testament to the impact that people can have in these places and in these spaces and and how do we, uh, I think it's just really getting the, the, the knowledge and the know-how out there to, to the younger generation that this is an, an opportunity for them um, to kind of make that change that they've been wanting to see. And like I said, like I can't tell you how many people I interview who just like didn't know that this was a thing that they could do. And I think that's like the first step is like, let's make sure that everyone knows that this is something that they can be doing. And then maybe once we kind of have that in control, we can think about how we rebrand and and make government seem more fun. But I don't think that there's a, I think I've learned that there's not a lack of people who want to do this work. It's just how do we get them those opportunities? We have over 1500 applications come in for our programs and like we can only place like 5% of the people who wanna do this work. So there's a huge gap in the number of people who want to do this and the number of opportunities available. So that would be my not answer to your question is, I don't know if it's particularly a rebrand issue at this at this point, at least not from from my perspective. But but your marketplace, to use a, a private sector term, yeah. is supply constrained. You have a lot of demand for people in these positions. You just need to get places to place them. Uh, yeah. Diana, what are you working on right now? For me, I'm working. I so I work in economic development. Um, and work really closely with local municipalities, but also our governor's office. Um, and, and some of the things that I'm working on are really COVID related and being able to um, being able to sort of give these streamlines of capital of access to capital um, and access to funds to a lot of small and mid-sized businesses in New Jersey. Uh, and Rachel, you're the CDO of Utah. Yeah. Um, what does that entail? Is, I mean, I, it's probably faster to say what it doesn't entail, but that's a lot of work too. Well, it's 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 new for um, for Utah to be thinking along the lines of like, oh, you know, how do we use our our data in such a way that like um, it's beneficial to more than just one agency, or uh, you know, in a way that cuts through um, the silos that the data is owned by, or federal regulations that govern some of this data uh, so that we can use it for a greater public good. It is an asset, so the more that we get out of it, the more value it you know it has and provides, and uh, we're not maximizing the value of our data. So I'm just involved in, in um, projects and, and conversations along that end of um, how do we maximize the value of our, of the data that we have um, in very, you know, business goal sort of um, use cases. So uh, this may be a touchy subject, and you can tell me to stop asking questions if you want. But I'd like to talk a little bit about ageism and marginalization. Uh, one of the big themes at Forward 50 this year is um, the idea that we need to modernize technology, and that that often means either decommissioning legacy systems or uh, reawakening them and understanding them again. But they tend to be built in fairly ancient monolithic architectures. They tend to use COBOL, a power builder, lots of other technologies that we really aren't that familiar with. And you know, the last time we had to summon all the people that still understood those might have been Y2K. Um, certainly there's a need to do uh, succession planning and to bring in new talent into government, but there's also a risk that we marginalize older uh, technologists and reinforce this perception that, that if they've been around for a while, they can't do the latest work and they're relegated to maintaining old systems. How much of making sure that government employees are technically astute and can do the work of digital innovation comes from recruitment versus uh, internal retraining and career building. And how do you think that that's going to play out as so many of these skills become digital? What are you seeing in your governments as an effort to sort of retool the existing employees while still bringing in new ones? And Rachel, maybe if you can say what Utah is doing there, but again, I don't want to put you in an uncomfortable position, so uh, don't feel you have to answer that if you don't want to. No, that's a that's a really hard problem, and and we 
see that um, quite a bit. And, um, you know, government um, was incentivized, our retirement systems were incentivized, you know, to kind of put people on sort of pension based plan and 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 basically slate them for you know years 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 decades long um, careers in the one government system and so we have a lot of uh, of these people who are having to retool and um, they're on the cusp of retirement and so what do we do um, and um, we have um, programs like you know a plural site subscription I, I know that um, that DTS our technology services agency has those kinds of like um, learning uh, programs and access to you know O'Reilly Media and things like that to to try to get up to speed. Um, but um, it's been a difficult issue, I think, forever problem in IT of you know figuring out what's worth even maintaining and what's worth going out to vendors and and those conversations are also really important as as we hire new talent because uh, if people's careers with us are shorter, then we can't rely on building uh, stuff the way that we used to as well. So um, that's a tough one to crack. Dana, you're working in economic development stuff, and obviously that's heavily related to COVID right now. Uh, there's a certain amount of elasticity needed in government programs, right? Something like um, economic development support at a time of pandemic is going to be different from, let's say, massive climate change or wildfires spreading everywhere. Um, in the past, as Ariana said, we tended to have like, you know, this was your job. And I think we had, we had institutionalized, as Rachel just said, this idea that you're going to have one job in government and then retire. Uh, what are you seeing change in terms of the ability for employment and staffing to be elastic or for people to move from department to department? Is that is that different from how it used to be? I definitely think that it is different from how it used to be. Sorry, my headphone came out. Um, but it... Just remember, if technology worked, we'd all be out of jobs, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it definitely has changed. I think COVID has, uh, for, you know, for state government in New Jersey, it's, for us, it has, especially being on the economic um, hand in, in the state for small and mid-sized businesses, um, we have had to really be all hands on deck. So there's no um, really, this is out of my job description, right? Um, especially right now, if you're in government, you know everything um, is an emergency at this rate, whether it's getting some data sets over or funding. Um, so right now, I think we're seeing this sort of a little bit more creativity um, with what you can and can't do. Um, and I think COVID has taught us that we have to be more innovative with our programs and with um, just how you look at economic development from a sustainable lens, um, both environmentally, economically. Um, but I definitely think it has um, inspired a lot of people and a lot of, um, you know, elected officials to, to be more innovative and, and think differently. Um, some examples of that can be, um, you know, government starting um, technical assistance program for e-commerce for their entrepreneurs. Um, so it, it really is, I think, taking a turn um, with being more transparent and being more innovative. All people of all ages and all backgrounds bring value to the work that we do here in government because we serve everyone. We don't get to pick our users uh, and they don't even get to pick us. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um, we, we, we need um, the institutional knowledge and the lessons learned from people who've served decades in government to tell us, yeah, well, we tried that before and you know, some of that might be folklore, but some of that might be really legit. Like, don't go do that thing. We've, we've tried that before. Um, and so I, I, there's so much that we um, need to maximize from the different people who we have working in government. We should be grateful for the people we have. There's incredible public servants everywhere. Um, and um, I think the more that we, we cross pollinate, the better. One of the Can you talk a little bit more about what you mean by folklore? Yeah. Um, well, I, 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 I know what you know what that is, but um, folklore meaning um, uh, the, the notion that, you know, there's red tape and we don't totally know why, but there's probably a law out there that, you know, says that we can't do a certain thing. So we're just, we're not going to do it. We tried that. Don't try that anymore. Um, and um, that's, there's a lot of that um, in, in government that um, 
we're always trying to check assumptions around. It, it does seem to me that, like a, a weird tension, right? If you yeah. uh, if you don't listen to that wisdom, you wind up trying all the same things and making the same dumb mistakes the previous people did. If you do listen to it too much, then you never create change. So how do you find that tenor? Because when you bring someone straight out of school, they're idealistic and they're enthusiastic and they're willing to run through walls and stuff. And you don't want to pour that molasses all over them. But at the same time, you don't want you want them to pick their battles. Has that been something you've had to learn as you've entered the public sector? Yeah, definitely. Ariana and Diana, do you have stories along those lines? No, I, I definitely do. Um, especially I, when I worked in local government, um, sometimes you're so idealistic and, and, and really coming out of, uh, out of, uh, you know, undergrad or grad school. Um, and sometimes you have to just deal with, you think you're going to try something new and innovative and then it fails. Um, and sometimes that's just part of the process, right? Uh, everyone, you have something to learn from everyone, like Rachel said. Um, but I definitely do think you have, to, we have to, you know, be, take everyone's opinion, be mindful. Um, if you're starting one thing, collect information and, and really um, discuss those ideas with everyone across all those different boards. Um, but I definitely do sometimes failure is part of that process and being able to cope with that um, and, and learning about it. Um, so that's part of what I think. Yeah, I would say that I've, I think what helps whenever I've been put on a team is to really understand the team and what the team's goals in goals are and, and how you plug in there. Um, I worked with the New York mayor's office of data analytics, which was a lovely experience and a lovely team. And I didn't know what to expect when I came in, but I ended up spending the summer, like finding a way to better utilize this triage system they had for their open data portal, um, which like doesn't seem new and shiny. Like they just couldn't acquire a new piece of technology given the constraints of government. And so my task was to be like, here's this system that we know doesn't quite work for what we're doing, but like, can you make it better? And knowing, and I've, I've now we have, uh, we're placing uh, Coding It Forward uh, fellows with that team. But so I've gotten to reconnect with some of the people that I worked with. And they're like, we're still using your new thing that you like did for us. Um, and so I think when you get to know the team and what the mission of that team is, you can better uh, understand what your role is and not be like, oh, you're not having me build this new shiny thing. Like, no, like the thing that I worked on that like wasn't new or shiny, like actually ended up having a, a big impact. And I think there's those kinds of pieces that you can plug into, um, which may not seem super exciting right off the bat, but when you get to look back on what your work did, um, I think that's a really, you kind of have to wait for the the exciting yeah, piece. Yeah, there's a line in, in Marianne Bellotti's Kill It With Fire where she talks about, or part of the book where she talks about the uh, need to celebrate things a little differently that so much of this is human factors. It's, it's making the team realize they have agency and that uh, while they might not get that sort of shiny gold star for being best in class and making something remarkable, they have to take pride in, in the results of the things that were built atop them. That like if you built code and it, it gets refactored in a few years, that doesn't necessarily mean you did a bad thing or wrote it wrongly. It means it was in demand enough that people felt they needed to refactor it because it was so important. And so it's almost like learning how to celebrate different kinds of achievements from what we're traditionally uh, used to. Yeah, 100%. No, I think all the work that I've gotten to do at the, at the local level is just maybe like not what I expected. I was rewriting like metadata standards and like creating a playbook for like how metadata should go on the open data portal. And like, that doesn't seem, I wasn't writing any code, like I wasn't doing anything like crazy, but it's like, it's a lasting impact that like will maybe help the people who are writing the code do their job a little bit better a couple months down the line. And it's just really I, hard to put really it on exciting. Instagram and have your friends get excited about it. Yeah, right? exactly. No, it's really exciting. And then like, I found that my stint in local government was the summer after my freshman year. And like, I was one of the only people in my group of friends who was doing that. And when I came back to campus, people were like, that's so cool. Like, I, like you got to work. Like, it was like, people didn't, again, like people just didn't know that you could be doing that. Quite frankly, like I didn't know. Like I fell into to local government. My dad met a guy in his building who was looking for an unpaid intern. And I was already coming home to Los Angeles to spend the summer at home the summer after my freshman year. And I was like, well, I'm be sitting on my couch. May as well like go intern somewhere. And thus like became the rest of my 
my journey. And my hope is that that's not like, that doesn't have to be the case, right? That someone doesn't have to fall into the job to understand that people are using technology and government. Um, yeah, that's kind of a roundabout to what we were talking about earlier. But um, what, what should we do to make it not accidental? I mean, Diana, if you could, if you could rewrite the budget and allocate fifty million dollars to any program you wanted that would improve people's desire to spend at least some of their technical careers working in the public sector, how would you spend it? What would you spend that money on? I would definitely spend that money on creating pipeline programs where uh, they can sort of, um, depending on what level it is, uh, on the in the federal agency side, um, hop from one agency to the other without feeling constricted to one thing. Um, and I think that's a major problem. Uh, for me, I, I'm also, I also like to jump around and, and do different things. And I think um, our, our generation is very much um, collectively wants to uh, just try new and different things all the time. And so definitely a pipeline program where um, you're not sort of only set for one thing um, and where you could, you know, begin being able to move around or also another uh, same type of program, but you can do um, sort of, you know, rotations and one rotation federal rotation in Boston, one in Atlanta, um, to sort of keep people interested in going. Um, I, I definitely think, you know, being able to pick up and go somewhere new uh, and being able to, you're not, you know, set on one thing or one place, um, I think is definitely something that people look forward to. That's an awesome point that, that whenever you're in marketing, you play to your strengths. And one of the strengths of the federal government is I can let you live in 15 cities in 15 years if you want to see the world, especially with some of the work from home things we got from COVID. That's something that most employers can't offer, but for the federal government, it's pretty well documented. Uh, I really liked your point, Diana, about uh, you know letting people move from, from department to department or task to task. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that require a certain amount of standardization though, so that you know, you, you're using the same tool set? Like if there's a component that you're government has built to do notifications or to have people fill in forms or whatever. And that component is consistent. It makes it much easier for you to move from the department to, to department and use the same tools. So how much of the, the government, how much of the employment mobility is dependent on the standardization of the platforms that you're working with? I would say my, I'll let Diana kind of field this one. But my quick two sentences, uh, I think there does require some amount of standardization, but also we place students at 10 plus federal agencies and we're not changing who we're recruiting based off of the systems. Like there are actually a lot of awesome federal government departments and uh, that are using modern tools. Uh, and so my two cents would be that, like, maybe it is more like, maybe we haven't looked into that. Like maybe it is a bit more transparent. I think that's the optimistic answer. Uh, I'm sure there's a whole bunch of constraints that are in there, but um, we have been able to place somewhat of the same students in different places across the federal government. But Diana, I'll let you field that one. I definitely do think a lot of those skills, also I agree with Ariana, are transferable um, and being able to transfer those systems back and forth. Um, you know, you're always going to be learning something new wherever you go. Um, and I think that's just part of the process. Um, and, you know, being able to understand new, new regulations and policies. I think, for example, if you're going from one agency to Atlanta, from Atlanta to Seattle, different agency, different department, um, and maybe something in Atlanta was more innovative than how they're doing it in Seattle, you can bring those new ideas, policies, procedures, business operations, whatever it might be, um, to that new entity. And so there's also that transfer of knowledge and information um, that's institutional from somewhere else to another place in the US. And I would say that like a lot of the teams, which Rachel is a part of this summer with our Civic Innovation Corps, like a lot of our teams are interested in, in sharing knowledge and using kind of the people that we're placing with them over the summer to be like, hey, like, can we share best practice across city and state government entities? So I think there's a there's an appetite for that. It's just how do we make that happen? Rachel, what was the Civic Innovation Corps? So the Civic Innovation Corps is uh, the newest iteration out of the Coding It Forward organization, um, and Ariana is leading it. So it's basically they've they've put um, you know students and early career folks in federal government for the past few years. 
Now they're looking at state and local. And I think it's there's seven or eight different state. I think we have, we landed on nine, I think. Nine. <laughs> yeah. I'm on our um, many innovation core. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, nine um, locales, I guess you can say, um, that are that are more local government oriented and um, where they're going to have um, students. And so I'm really excited this summer. We're going to have four here in our office. They're remote. They're from all over the country. And so we're going to get to um, try working that way. Um, but, you know, two cents also on, um, you know, the, the rotation idea of talent. Um, we have a new boss here at the governor's office of planning and budget. She's incredible. And, and she's really creating a flat hierarchy for or, our organization. There are four people who are supervisors because it's helpful to have somebody like do your timesheet, but it's way more um, unstructured and way more, you know, here's an assignment for now and you're going to get to it. And, you know, here's a backup and, and then we're going to rotate in a few years. Let's see how this works and we'll rotate. And um, building that sort of redundancy, I think, is awesome, not only for retention and, um, you know, recruitment, but but for um, the work life balance that that people need, like parenting, all of those things that happen. Um, I, and I, I hope we can see more of that going forward. You, there's two really interesting things you touched on there. Uh, Diana, your point about the fact that younger federal employees can be agents of cross pollination because they're likely to move from place to place. They don't have kids in school yet who keep them in a particular city. So they're not at a part of their life where mobility is difficult. And then Rachel, what you were saying, a lot of the mechanisms and hierarchies that we used to understand uh, were because we needed sort of command and control top-down structure because we didn't have tools like Slack or Teams in the workspace where you could now coordinate almost organically. You can go grab a trouble ticket and say, I'll work on this or collaborate on something, you know, in a sort of very uh, intangible or, or flexible way. So um, super interested to hear about why you think technology makes it a more welcoming place for um, younger technologists to come in. Like, it's not just that we need tech employment, it's that tech being used in the government is changing the nature of employment and who's willing to work there. Are you seeing a difference in the kinds of jobs people are doing or the kinds of organizational structures like the one you just mentioned? If, if I can start on that, I um, definitely yes. And we've rolled out a really robust telework um, framework. It was pre-COVID even that we were rolling this out. We wanted to see as many state government employees work remotely and even move to rural Utah and boost our rural economies, you know, save our air quality, all of those things. We had that infrastructure um, coming on board. And, um, and so that really changed up like the way that people are working because they're working from, from home and this is you know, pre COVID and now we've learned even more. Um, another person who I, I'm really a fan of, um, Sahil Lavingia, um, he's in the private sector. He's a, um, CEO of Gumroad and, and, and a VC. Um, but um, he basically runs a company that doesn't have any meetings at all. They work completely asynchronously and they don't have to work full time. And it's kind of just, we're going to move along at the pace we move along. And they have the privilege of doing that because they have an established product. I'm not sure we could accomplish quite that in government, but there's a lot to learn from like, you know, I don't, I, I'm going to write out what I need to write out and you'll see it when you see it. And, you know, we don't have to have these traditional methods of communication um, and we're not working in physical spaces e anymore. Um, so we're a lot more accessible in those ways. Those are um, awesome, I think, for the needs of our generation. Yeah, and certainly open government up to the rest of the world that might not have considered that job. Uh, OK, so we only have a couple of minutes. Rachel, I want to hear how you'd spend your $50 million if you wanted to try and get more people uh, more younger people to consider spending some of their careers in the public sector? Um, I I don't think I would use uh, $50 million. I don't think I can use um, all that money. Um, I would uh, pay people what they ought to be paid, though. I, I do. I spend a lot of time with our frontline workers um, in, in years past um, for projects, and I just think they need to be paid way more. We're working on that. 
Yeah, definitely wage parity with the private sector is an important uh, important factor when you're dealing with tech workers. Okay, Arianna, let's bring it back to you since uh, <laughs> since you'd love to have that $50 million, although like Rachel, you might use it to subsidize people's wages so they're on par with the private sector. How would you spend that money to encourage people to spend some part of their technical career in the public service? This is not the first time that someone has posed this question and it's quite, my answer is quite similar to Rachel's. Like, that number is enormous to me. Like I can't even think of the things I would do with that amount of money because I don't even need that amount of money to get this ball rolling. Um, I think I would start with kind of uh, wage parity and making sure that we're on par with the other opportunities uh, that are out there for students. Uh, I think that would um, work in a positive direction and towards making these opportunities more inclusive and making sure that we have diverse voices in these positions um, in a way that we need the people that are working on these problems to look like the people that they're serving. That's always been a big deal for coding it forward. So I think this whole kind of wage and benefit parity would help that because now someone doesn't have to be like, oh, I oh, go ahead, Child care. I'm a new mom, childcare, paid um, <laughs> yeah. maternity leave. So yeah, someone I'm up here in there. Canada, so so we have a different set of a yeah. different list, but, yeah. <laughs> but I think that's a big thing to like make sure that someone doesn't have to make a decision between government and something else because something else is offering them better. So I think that'd be the first one. Um, and then I think I would use a lot of it to help us continue to spread the word about the fact that these opportunities are out there and give some money to the people who are already doing that work. Um, because I think the first step is still making sure that people know that these opportunities are great and that they're there. But I'm but sure it does that seem like there's even... a role for a new kind of civics class too. Like we all take civics in high school yeah. and we all have STEM stuff and we all take computer courses. Maybe it's time to say civics is now a computer science course and your job is to build some apps and stuff on local data for something that's always bothered you about society and yeah you no know, yeah and we can make that, it part of the curriculum yeah i mean the folks at new america are trying to with their university network are trying to find a way to get kind of uh ethics and civics into cs curriculum and and do it the other way so that we kind of plant that seed in people's minds but yeah i don't think it would take that large sum of money for me to do some big things. So I think maybe we'd hold on to the rest of it so we could keep could keep thinking because I don't even think I'm in that far of a direction yet. Um, and yeah, you can do a lot with a little, I think. Fantastic. Well, it's amazing to see what Coding It Forward's done already in just four years. Um, and Diana and Rachel, you're both doing amazing things in very important parts of government. Um, where do you see yourselves? And we'll end with this. Where do you see yourself in 10 years, Diana? Well, I, I'm actually starting my PhD. So hopefully I'll be finished with that um, in 10 years. But What's the thesis um, on? Do you know yet? Uh, no, but I'm, I'm doing a PhD in city regional planning. I start in the fall, actually. But um, hoping, you know, that will, that'll take a few years. So, um, But I definitely hope to be serving in, in some some capacity um, in in state or in state or local government, um, and definitely will have to do probably in at, in some kind of like economics economic development. Um, but I definitely think I'll I'll have an odd trajectory, uh, you know, being in academia and being a practitioner. But um, I think that for me the goal is still some somewhat consistent. Rachel, you can have an odd trajectory. Yeah, I could not even begin to predict. <laughs> Sorry. And that's it's the okay. privilege of that, that this generation gets to enjoy. Ariana? Uh, yeah, I think it's like I just graduated a year ago. So, wow, 10 years is a is a big question. Uh, yeah, I think the, the sky's the limit. My other fun fact, I guess, is that I'm also an actress. So who knows? Will the civic tech, will that take over? I think that's a 10-year look. But I think where I would hope to be in terms of what I'm currently doing is that we've either fix this early career pipeline in a way that like my work is no longer needed because it's a ship that is sailing mm. or that 10 years from now, I'm still doing this, but we're far ahead of where we are now um, would be my big, my big 10 year. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for spending some time uh, talking about this succession planning, modernization. None of this stuff happens without humans. And it's amazing to see what uh, we can do to change people's perceptions of a career in government particularly as some of the technologies are making those choices different from what they were for our parents, for example, or at least your parents, because I'm old enough to be your parents. Uh, but thank you all for spending some of your life in public service, at least. 
and uh, for spending some of today with us talking about this stuff. It's been great chatting with you all.